Welcome to Impact Farming, where we introduce you to the people and ideas that will have a massive impact on your farming operation. Brought to you by Farm Marketer. Sit down, start the engine, and let's roll with today's show. Hello, and welcome back to another segment of the Impact Farming Show. And today, we have an amazing returning guest, the always, always, always amazing Dick Whitman. How are you? Very good, Tracy. Good. So for those of you that have seen episodes with Dick before, you'll know that Dick is the operator of Whitman Consulting. He is the board chair and former manager of a 20,000 acre farm. He is an author of a farm business guidebook that we'll talk about, a speaker, a coach. Did I miss anything, Dick? You got it, I think. I covered it all. Okay. He's a man of many talents. And today we are going to be chatting about how to get out of the way without going away. And we are taking the title of this presentation that you did at the Egg X conference just this past December. And that is Farm Management Canada's business, egg business conference. So I'm excited to talk to you about this, Dick, because this is, I'm sure, a topic that many in the founding generation struggle with. So do you want to dive right in? Sure. Okay. I think what's really created the demand for this topic is <clears throat> that the, uh, the transition of ownership and management in agriculture has changed significantly over the last 40 years. 40 years ago, a lot of family businesses, um, when the senior members were ready to retire, hopefully they had groomed talent that was interested in carrying it on. <clears throat> and they would announce their retirement date and oftentimes do a farm buyout or lease the farm to the next generation all in one fell soup. What's happened is with the escalation of capital it has takes to require a viable farm. Farmers are, are managing millions of dollars of capital and the transition of ownership, something that is much more complex and has to take place over a much longer period than necessarily the transition of management. So we have a, a lot of farm managers or CEOs out there that are they're reaching the end of their career where they're ready to step out or step down or step away but they don't know what a step to. Um, their fear is that if I let go of the reins, I have to die, that there's nothing beyond being the boss. And they may well have competent candidates that can succeed them from a management standpoint, but if they're only defining their success as being the one in charge and they haven't looked at the next step in this process, then they're just going to hold on to the wheel until they're in their 70s and then their 80s and their 90s and they're they're going to be frustrated and they're going to chase away competent successors in the business. So one of the most common challenges I face with more longer, long tenure to clients is people who are in that stage of life, they're ready to transition management. And what we've had to do is to help them understand that there's a next step in the career path. And that is becoming the board chair or the mentor or the coach and since you're still a major owner in the business, you can't just hand the reins to the next generation and say, here, do what you want, because that next generation is gambling with your capital, or a huge percentage of the capital is capital you control. So it's not unreasonable to function from a board standpoint where you want board oversight or board chair oversight, but you still want to figure out a way to get away from the data um, operational leadership. So that's kind of background of where this topic has come about. Okay. I love it. When we were preparing for this, Dick, we emailed back and forth and I said, you know, I could understand the stress of wanting to retire. You emailed back and you said something, Tracy, you're way too young to think about that. But, you know, <laughs> and I've said this and thank you for that, by the way, 29 and holding. <laughs> um We've mentioned this before and I've mentioned it before in a few episodes. I said, I think I'm in an age where I have one leg on each side of the fence. 
I'm young enough to understand being 20 and 30. Oh, right. I'm 29. <laughs> I'm young enough to understand <laughs> that eagerness and the drive and the want to take it over and all of that that comes with the 20s and 30s. But I'm also old enough to start looking and going, wow, I love what I do. I don't want to ever stop doing this. And then the stress and the, just the thought of my grandfather when he was still alive or the founder generation, I can understand why they hang on. That's you love it. That's what kept you going that long. And you also don't know what life is outside of your business. I'm a business owner and a farmer on the egg business side. That would make me a little bit uncomfortable. So I'm always sympathetic and I get a little bit frustrated that we don't help farmers retire. What's that big vision? What's the excitement? What's that next step? Nobody wants to step into something that looks like a punishment, right? So when I heard your presentation, I thought it was clever. We want the founders to have a happy retirement and be healthy, happy, successful. But how do they do that? Nobody helps them, right? I think this is very well, time. Yeah, one, and one of the challenges, Tracy, is that the term retirement has been overused. I prefer to use the term transition. Mm. So everybody asks me, oh, when are you going to retire? How is retirement? And I said, well, transition is going well. Mm. Because there are farm owners and managers who are at the end of their working career and they're tired and they just want to be done. Mm. Okay. And so they're not looking oftentimes for any kind of active involvement beyond a retirement age. but for those that are heavily invested in a viable operation, they're healthy. They might be in their early to mid 60s and they're going, I love this kind of work, but I need to let I need to create an environment where the next generation can have that same challenge. But I don't want to go away. So defining a different job in that transition process instead of calling it retirement transitioning from the role of general manager to a different role. And that, that new role hopefully will be less um, punishing in terms of the time commitment. It can be a phase into an ultimate retirement, <clears throat> but being engaged in a business at the level of a board chair where your focus is on strategic planning, on leadership development for the incoming CEO, um, maybe helping to Work with younger people, putting your intellectual or, or your historical perspectives into writing and in standard operating procedures. There's lots of things you can do that can help build continuity and excellence that allow you to step away from the day-to-day -day managerial role in a business. And so if that's a mutual desire, both on the people coming in as well as the one person that's trying to transition out, um, the challenge is, what is the environment we have to have to make that work? And first of all, there already has to be an understanding in the governance process that a viable and working uh, owner board is essential to the, it's one of the essential ingredients. If you've never had a board of directors, never had a board meeting, you don't look at some of your owners as truly being the, the owner board for your business, you need to get that part of your governance structure defined first. Once that's there, you can differentiate between a board meeting and a day-to-day -day manager meeting or a staff meeting where that's not someplace you should be. Yeah. And I, most people have a board function in their business. It's just not clearly defined in their organizational structure. It's not transparent, but they do board functions on a regular basis. They re review financials. They think about policy on how they're going to pay their people or when. They, they think about uh, strategic planning once in a while and where's the business going long term. So the fact that you're doing these things, you are in effect doing some of the things that an, an effective board of directors would be doing. But by more clearly defining those as the role of the board and then looking at the role of the CEO moving to a, a board chair or mentor, it gives real substance to that job and gives 
the person moving into that job kind of a little bit of excitement of a new role in the business. Okay. I know there was a few notes that you made with the presentation, and I have a few here. You talked about the foundation of a success, successful transition. And the other thing was strategy for transitioning key roles in the business. Yeah. So did you want to expand on any of those? Where did you want to take that? Well, I'll take the second question. I think we've already hit on the first one, which is in that in order to have a foundation for doing this well, there needs to be a commitment on the team to have a documented governance structure. And by that, I mean, how we do things now in terms of organization charts, job descriptions for current members, written policies and how things are done should be in writing. And then if that's the case, if that's done well, then that can lead us into the second question of if you'd rephrase that the way you rephrased. Um, hold on. I've got to grab my exact words that you said in the presentation. Strategies for transitioning <clears throat> key roles in the business. So kind of that foundation of successful sure. transition. And then actually, what are the strategies to help that founder go to chair, CEO? Well, there's several things that are important. One is that it needs to be clear on potential successor candidates of what is the job of management <clears throat> and what, if you look at the simple cut and dried standard definition of a manager, they plan, they organize, they implement staff and control, but it's a little more complicated than that. So people that are aspiring to be managers should like the acts of managing. They should, they should enjoy staffing and bringing people on board into a business. They should enjoy organizing a planning meeting with the team to look at long-term strategic direction of the business. Um, they also need to have the right attributes to work with the team of the future. So oftentimes in transition, a senior member might be a stage one business where it's a dad or a grandpa or an uncle or a mother or whatever. And oftentimes transition involves in the next generation, two or more siblings or cousins, the kind of leadership that's required to be successful in, in that kind of transition may require attributes that are more, fo more focused on team building, good, solid professional communication, um, looking at somebody who's going to empower others as opposed to somebody that says, I'm boss, I'm going to tell everybody what to do. It's, it's more about facilitating people individually doing pieces of the budgeting process and pulling it together to make a plan. So as you're looking at candidates that will succeed you as the CEO, it needs to be really clear what, what is your job as a boss or a CEO? And second of all, what are the desired attributes that your team's gonna wanna see? And if those are clearly defined, you can have that written job description and those attributes, and then it gives you something that's uh, a frame of reference <clears throat> to, to vet candidates. The other thing that I strongly think is, is useful is things like the DISC profile, <clears throat> the Colby test, and strength finders are, are leadership and communication tools that do a good job of helping people to self-assess where they are. And those can often be very revealing both to, to those that are thinking that they're qualified for a job and also for the other members of the team. There are some times where people think they want to be boss well, they simply lack the leadership or the assertiveness that would be essential to be successful. Yeah. And once you vet some of these candidates with some of these tech, these tools, you come back and go, well, we could, we could force this, but this could be a significant wreck. Yeah. Uh, trying to put somebody in the role of a boss or a manager that really doesn't have the aptitude or the leadership traits that are necessary to be successful. You know, it's funny. Everybody wants to be boss till you need to do boss things, like they say. Yeah. And, you know, even there's some people that can be boss, but when you got to do boss things, you're like, I don't want to do this. I just want to go sit in the combine and com and combine the fields, right? So, Dick, and I know I always 
I try and bridge the gap here because you guys are a really large farming operation. And in our audience, there's some really large farming operations, mid-size, right down to small. And sometimes being us, we are on the smaller end. I try and bridge the gap. Some of these concepts sound, and you know, I kind of, I kind of bring this up every time we talk. I just want to make it relatable and this mindset for every size of operation because that dad and son, dad and daughter operation, how good for the big farms. This is very relevant, right? Like the board, the multiple brothers, sisters, cousins farming together, like you got to be bang on. But sometimes I would challenge if we're a small two-person, three-person operation, how do we use this concept, especially with the getting out of the way, using that I'm the board, here, I'm the board chair. I'm the CEO. How do we use these concepts for those smaller farms? Yeah. Well, I, I, I hear your question and I get this a lot in doing workshops. And so I guess the best way to describe this is that you don't bring a cannon to kill a fly. You only build as much governance complex structure and complexity as you need for the size and complexity of your business. But for years, I've done transition planning workshops where we do a case study that involves a very simple farm. It's mom and dad. They have a son and daughter-in-law working in the business, and they have a daughter and a son-in-law who are working in the business. And they are trying to prepare them to start coming into more than just a wage earner. They want to become owners someday, and they want to become more engaged in some form of management. And the parents are in their mid-50s. They're, they're not looking at retiring tomorrow. They're saying, you know, I might have another 10 years here, but you kids are coming to the point now where you're ready to be more than just an hourly wage in person. So how do we start defining the leadership transition process? And so a lot of this is a matter of degrees. It's not a Cold turkey, we go, 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 go. And then one day, okay, I'm done. Okay, somebody else can run this now. Think of this as more of a long-term gradual transition. So in this case study, it's, I've had up to 200 people in a room that come to the same answers. That One of the first challenges is that they need to create a functioning board of directors. And it may be mom and dad and each of the, of the boys and the daughters and daughter-in-laws. That initial board might only be six people. But it's the fact that now when they have a meeting, the meeting, the things they talk about as a board should only be dealing with things that a board deals with. Okay. When do we start talking to dad about when you're going to read or retire? What's the process going to be for replacing you? Uh, maybe that board approves the annual capital purchase budget. It reviews financials. It has a regular list of policies that need to be documented and make sure they're reviewing them and and either reapproving them or revising them on a regular basis. Okay. It and this this might be a once a quarter, it might be twice a year, but it's it's differentiating that the things you do when you sit around the campfire or the stove planning what you're going to do today or this week or this month operationally is different than the things you do when you're wearing your board hat. And so when you start thinking about when are we going to introduce the issue of ownership transition. A working board will have thought through and said, what is our family business policy on ownership transition? And that's a harder question than people think. Have we really thought through, you know, who would be eligible? Will it be blood family only or do son-in-laws, daughter-in-laws, are they family? Uh, what about a non-family employee? Having thought through those questions and <clears throat> have it in the policy, Positions you so that when the day comes, you not only know the policy, but people have made sure that they've prepared to meet the criteria to be an eligible investor. Mm -hmm. Same thing as an eligible employee. So <clears throat> there's a huge void in agriculture in farmers look at, I mean, the responsibilities they have that are boardsmanship type roles. Yeah. And we don't want to confuse this with the big corporate board that's meeting every month and they have once they're high paid outside directors to come and meet and do things. We're just talking about crawling before you, you walk and you walk before you run. Okay. 
Okay. I like it. I always, because we do, we're not a 20,000 massive farm where we would have that structure in place. So I like to make it relatable for those one or two person, three person operations. Really what I hear from you, and I think I draw this every time I ask this question to you, structure, planning, taking kind of those farm business management and the family circles and separating them. Kind of a few of the things I picked out when you said that is a time, a place, a structure to talk about the very big high level conversations. So instead of trying to nag mom or dad about buying the farm every weekend and every week and it's unproductive, it's, hey, once a year, we're going to talk about our progression towards you guys purchasing the farm. Once a month, we meet about operations. So if you're a small farm, yes, and I do believe I drew this from your last time we spoke, Dick, and what I really like is it's... It's just taking the family and the business and saying, here, let's talk about it in a structured type setting at a relevant place at a relevant time where we are discussing those ideas. Is that right for that smaller farming operation? Exactly. And I I love to tell the story about many years ago, I keynoted a Farm Bureau Young Farmer Conference. And there were 900 young farmers there, all under age 35. Wow. And you could just... You could just sense the energy and the passion in this room because these are the best of the best in all 50 states in the U.S. And this young couple came up to me after the presentation, and they were really excited about um, what we talked about. And and, uh, they said, you know, this is all well and good, but I don't see what this applies to us. It's just the guy and his wife, and they have this little baby in their arms. We're just this little simple farm operation. And before I could answer the question, the wife says, I need to go to the bathroom with the baby. So she goes off. And so I asked this guy a little bit about their business. It's like, tell me about your roles and what you do versus what your wife does. He said, well, I'm pretty much the agronomy manager and I handle the the mechanical operations. And uh, my wife handles all the, the bookkeeping, the marketing functions. He's the CFO. And then she drives truck for me in the field. And he's going on about how this clear division of responsibilities. And she came back from the bathroom and I said, now, who is this young lady? And he said, oh, this is just my wife. And I said, excuse me, you just gave me this long dissertation about what this lady did to your operation, how critical she was in all these different functions and how you have this clear responsibility, clearly divided and He was turning from red to beet red, and she was sitting there beaming. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. And then I looked at him, and I kind of winked, and I said, don't you ever introduce your wife like that again. Mm. Because he had no idea that to an outsider, he was bragging about how important a part of his team was. And yet, the only thing that he cared to talk about when she came up was the fact that she was his wife. Hmm. And, and I, I said, you'll never do that again, William. He said, no. So then we were able to carry on the conversation that I said, You're, are you always going to be a business of your size and always have this little baby that's only one year old? What happens by the time that kid's 15 years old and your business has grown and expanded? Maybe you have three or four other employees. Um, aren't they going to know what your company policy is on a number of things from compensation to work hours to whatever? And uh, what if your son or daughter comes to you someday and says, you know, what's the chances of me buying into this business? What would be the pathway for ownership? Or what if they come to you and say, if I were to be qualified as an employee, what would I have to do? Having thought through some of those things in advance, as you get bigger, your need for governance structure should grow with the growth of your business. So think of this as a dynamic continuum where right now your life is as simple as it's going to get. But also think about the fact that right now, two of you are the CEO, the CFO, the agronomy manager. You are both chairman and co-chairman of your board of directors. 
you have all the same things that this very sophisticated business has down the road. You just don't have any players. Yeah. But all those hats already exist. And the amount of complexity that goes behind each one of those hats will be nothing but increase as you move out through your career. And you went, okay, I get it. So this isn't about structuring something like it, IBM on day one. It's about as my business grows, I need to add the same complexity and, and governance complexity that I all am doing in my farming operation. Yes, you get it. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. And, you know, maybe that's a stumbling block I have too, because when I hear some of those terms, I think IBM, I go, wait a minute, how? So I love that you connect the dots. And, you know, the funny thing is farmers and farm families are so skilled. They wear so many hats. And just like that young gentleman and his wife, they probably take for granted the fact that they wear four hats that, gosh, would be major roles in a IBM corporation, right? Well, in it, and this reminds me of a conversation I just had with a very large client. And this has happened repeatedly where these are businesses that are fairly large and they have a number of employees and they already have in place very detailed um, governance structure for all the other employees. They have clearly written job descriptions. They have an employee handbook where the employees know the policies, they have onboarding and training, except none of the owner man- managers have a job description. None of them gets an evaluation. Hmm. And just this week, I was talking to asking an individual, how much formalization of governance is involved in your business? And after we kind of sparred a little bit, he finally confessed, we have all of that for the rest of our employees. But funny, we don't have any of that for us as owners. <laughs> and so my point was, you cannot delegate what you can't define. If you want to start thinking about transitioning to a board chair, how, how does the pool of candidates, whether it's your son or your daughter or an in-law, how do they know what your job is unless it's in writing? Mm. And then how, how can you have an intelligent conversation about assuming they are skilled and they have the potential, what would be the leadership development strategy for bringing them along piece by piece? And when will we set up a timetable for transitioning many of these duties and responsibilities? Oftentimes it's not a work to the last second and then say, okay, now it's all yours. A much more frequent method is transitioning these in pieces and then having some official date where you say, now you're doing the bulk of the job of management. I'm, a, I'm officially transitioning to board chair and you are now officially the general manager or CEO. Mm. But it's that specific, that specificity, I can't get the word out, that has to be part of the equation. There needs to be clearly documented job descriptions for the CEO or those that are trying to transition out of these roles for people to know What are the decisions I'm going to have to make and what are the skill sets I'll need to be good at that job? Hmm. I like it. I'm flashing back to a different conversation that I had with a farm advisor. And like you just said, in these farms, there's massive capital on many of the farms, right? It's not like (laughs) it used to be. Land is super expensive. There's big loans, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the objections of the founders is being concerned that the upcoming generation's just gonna, it's all gonna fall to pieces when they go away. So I guess to me, I'm hearing that like the corporate structure and it's small as you go, but you're in a habit of thinking of it as a board and managers and employees, even if you're two or three people. So then when you get to that point where you're retiring, it's like, okay, I'm retiring, whatever the details are, but I'm moving to board. Me, Tracy, and Anthony, we still have a lot of capital on the line. And you guys are amazing next generation. But we can't step away because, hey, our our signatures are still on here. So we are going to move to board. And that's a different role. And that makes me feel better because it's not just, okay, here's the keys. We're gone. And then you want to pipe up, but you know you're supposed to be retired, right? 
that kind of right. right. And, and there's, there's two dynamics that I think we need to make sure we have in place. And one is making sure that people are aware of the consequences of a wrong decision. And part of delegating is not delegating so fast that you allow somebody to make a mistake that could be fatal to your business. Yeah. So a big challenge for people exiting their role as CEO is to avoid micromanaging. When you've done this for so long, it's like the, the controller in the airport plane control tower. They just know what to do. They don't even give it a second thought. And Oftentimes, we're frustrated at maybe the slowness of a decision or the fact that maybe they're doing it a different way than I would have done it. But we have to check ourselves and say, but are they getting the job done? Mm. If they didn't do it exactly the way I would have done it, how costly was it? If it's not a fatal mistake, how are they going to learn if we don't give them a little bit of rope to do it different ways? And the other dynamic that's really critical is this can only work if there's already an attitude of accountability that's clearly established. In other words, if you're going to aspire to be the CEO and when the CEO transitions out of that job to board chair, there needs to be a robust performance evaluation process in place that the board as a group is doing an evaluation of its management, just like maybe you as a manager are doing with your employees. Yeah. Now, I have some people that are candidates that – think themselves as very fit, but they just, they go berserk at the idea that mom or dad would give them an evaluation. It's like, well, I don't need that. And yet, how can you grow? And when you are gambling with someone else's capital or you're not the majority owner, why would you not expect that you have to be accountable and that part of being accountable is being open to constructive feedback? Mm. That's that's a hard conversation that has to happen more often than just right now. I could see that. And, you know, more and more, Dick, every time I talk to you about this type of stuff, I just put myself in those shoes. And let's say we're a small to mid-sized type of operation. We have kids coming up. Now that we as a generation have these ideas and you guys at our fingertips, to me, this is a great mindset process structure to put in from an early age, let's say your kids are coming up and then they get a part-time job on the farm, whatever the case is. If you can put this structure in place, oh, and I said the exact same thing we talked about this last time, it separates the family and the business. It really does because if you are watching your son or daughter make up, terrible mistake you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna want to give feedback but now are you mom or dad and then you're conflicting as a family and then you're just damaging that role where if you take it to a business structure is it a different hat in a formal setting and a process where can we help protect those relationships where we're like hey we're at our monthly performance manager meeting. We're reviewing financials. Hey, little Johnny, I noticed this versus at the kitchen table. You know what? You spent way more on that grain than you had to. I really think that's bad to sit. Do you get what I mean? Yep. Even no matter what size and do it young in your operation is what I would hear because by the time your kids get in, they're not going to think twice. And exactly like you said, I wouldn't want a performance review from my parents all of a sudden out of the blue. But if we know those are things we talk about in a formal setting, then the process is in place from a young age, right? Yeah. So who evaluates you? Me, myself, and I. I'm hard enough. <laughs> and then when Anthony tries, it doesn't go well. <laughs> yeah. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> Yeah, that's but you see, my point is, you, if you start looking at yourself as a, a major proprietor of the business, who is your peers um, group that you feel somewhat accountable to, and how? It's really important, I think, for CEOs and general managers to be rather innovative in how they structure an evaluation process. <clears throat> Matter of fact, in the guidebook, we actually have a different evaluation template for a board to evaluate a manager than 
the kinds of methods we might use with just general employee. Because employees are more operational day to day, whereas the manager, you're looking as much at how you do your job as what the actual results are of the business. And I always say good process is a predictor of good results. So if, if there's no sounding board or some evaluation body that you can look to that knows what your goals are and knows what your delivery of programs is all about and give you feedback, how do you, how do you get better? How do you know you're doing well? Yeah. I like it. Don't Not let to put you on the spot. It. Not to put that? you on the spot. Oh, no, that's Not okay. Put you on the spot. <laughs> I gave you the whole truth, but don't let Anthony watch this episode. I don't want no review. <laughs> I'm just bugging. Oh, okay. Yeah, I have, I have a good friend who uh, runs an electronics store where his wife is a very um, direct person, let's put it that way. And, I, and we were talking about the importance of having evaluations of your employees, including your family. And I said, so do you evaluate your sons and your wife? He said, yep. He says, once a year, I go into the vault with my wife and we do an evaluation. <laughs> so he was making the point that um, she can't escape from it and that he considered that a, just an important part of his job. And I just thought, man, that would be really interesting. Yep, I agree. Oh, good fun. I understand there's a lot of ideas here and thank you for bearing with me because I know even just in my shoes and the different producers that watch just sometimes terminology, even for me, how does that apply? Right. So, okay. I brought us on a bit of a rabbit trail as I always do, Dick. Do you want to touch on anything more about transitioning the key roles I'm really excited to ask you about lessons. You've been through this. You walk the talk. You teach this. Can you share some lessons, successes, regrets, different things you've learned on your journey? And also, you talk to a lot of farmers. So if you have anything else you want to add to our prior discussion before we go there, take it where you may. Okay. Well, I can... Tell you from firsthand experience, even though I've consulted on this topic for over 40 years, doing it as opposed to consulting is much harder. And even when you know the right things that you should do, it's just human nature. You've now transitioned. You have a new CEO on board. Let's say it's our daughter. And I told everybody, the team is all on board that this is a good decision. And so now you go to work. And you show up in the workplace and you're going there with the idea, okay, I'm retired or I'm transitioned out of this job. I'm just here to help. Mm -hmm. But how, how is your presence perceived by others? Mm -hmm. Uh, In, you may remember from the presentation, I have a little cartoon where all the crews standing around and, and you start out as a manager. Now you're no longer the manager, but you're showing up and going, okay, I'm here to help. And the other people, the little balloons popping up their heads are, what's he doing here? I thought he retired. Is he trying to boss again? Can he just let us do our job? It's You have to really consciously think about the image of what your presence is after you have stepped out of the role of manager. And that may mean that you, you come to the workplace, but you come after they do their morning planning. So you're not appearing to trying to coach that. Or... You, you come with the idea that you're not going to say anything and say, I'm just here to find out where people's needs are and uh, if anybody needs help. And if not, I'll go work on my work in my wood shop. So making it clear you're not there checking on people. Um, I think there's a really a strong dynamic when you have been the boss for years that when you show up, you're judging other people. Mm. No matter no matter how hard you say, oh, I'm not, no, I'm not. The perception is that you're judging. So people are going to be looking over their shoulders if you're around a lot. Yeah. So I know some really astute CEOs who made this transition and they said, one of the number one things you need to do is move your office. So even though there was room for the CEO who went to board chair to keep his office in the same building as his son or daughter, 
He said, I consciously made a choice to move out of that and downstairs into a separate office where people would walk in and see that my son is now occupying that job mm. and I'm not there. Yeah. That sends a message that I'm done with that job. So that's another, and another lesson I think is when you do show up or even when you're there by invitation to help out, you see things that need to happen and it's so tempting to go, well, have you guys thought about this? Or um, you inadvertently fall back into calling the shots and men and starting to uh, coach logistics, whether it's moving combines at harvest. And it's so hard just to not say a word and just show up like true help and say, where do you need me? Yeah. And stop there. Because the minute you go beyond that to start saying, well, have you guys considered doing this or that? You're back to your old job. And I think if you can truly live in, live up to that, that effort, people will see that you're trying. They'll know it's hard. And there needs to be an open discussion that there needs to be a lot of grace and forgiveness that goes both ways. Mm. You need to have a lot of grace and forgiveness about things that maybe you don't agree with the way other things are being done, but you need to ask for grace from others that, this is the new thing. Um, people assume, well, you know all about how to do this. Well, that's not true. Many people going through this transition are really struggling emotionally of what is the right balance. How do I define my success now that I've transferred over the baton? And so if there's a lot of respect, and grace, and patience, you can make this work. I love it. Not easy, but so important. Like you said, if you show up there as the boss, without even knowing it, you undermine the new leader, right? Yeah. And then the eyes go back to you. Oh, Dick's in charge still. That's, oh, that wouldn't be a easy process to go through that. Okay. That was a powerful point. And I love the grace and patience. That is so important. So successes, lessons, regrets, resolutions. I know you could probably chat for hours. Wanna, yeah, I know you've seen well, a lot. Another, done I need, a lot. Another one that we, this is the easy one to overlook is you go into this with the idea that your successor recognizes that you're the transition coach and they're, they're wanting to tap your knowledge as a resource, but it can't be, on a spur of the moment or when you're on the last energy of the day, mm. there needs to be thoughtful planning of when the coaching sessions are going to occur. So for example, a lot of times my daughter would wait till the last minute and say, I just really need your advice on marketing. Mm. It's like, I'm dead tired and it's the end of the day. And we've had no discussions about what plans are or whatever. I said, if you want meaningful coaching, you need to help prepare me for I can provide that. So yeah. we start challenging her to say, keep me up regularly posted on what your marketing plan is and where you, what's your percentage of crops sold. And I'm watching the markets every day. That's just something we do, even when we transition out of these roles. If I know what the plan is and I, I can answer some of your questions and kind of not tell you what to do, but give you some maybe some mentoring on how or some different ways that you can approach some of these things. So actually making it a point to regularly schedule these coaching sessions is really important and do it in the best part of the day, not with the last bit of energy left for the day. Cause that's when emotions jump up and people are tired and it's like, I hate this job. And why did I ever take this job? And it's got all the wrong outcomes when it's done that way. Isn't that the truth? And I'm sure even in that, there's probably now putting my younger cap on, there's probably that, oh, I don't want to ask. I feel the pressure that I should know. And I leave it to the very last moment. And then really having a sounding board is priceless. That's eventually, you know, I'm CEO and you gen you, you know what you need to do in your business. Yeah. But when you're by yourself and you feel that you can't talk to anybody, it's it's very stressful. I ended up hiring a coach mainly for that reason to have a sounding board. And you know how it usually went? It was blah. 
I told him all my thoughts. He just really <laughs> listened. And then, and then, you know, not saying I was always right, but you know what you have to do. And it's just somebody else hearing you out or asking a perfect question, right? And speaking of that, one of the challenges is I have a rule. If somebody asks me, what would you do? I will just respond by saying, that's a good question. And I've done that so many times, then they laugh. Okay, in other words, you're not going to tell me what to do. And I said, no. But if you ask me, how did you approach a challenge like this? What are some of the considerations that you walk through? I will help them to think through the analytical steps that it took to come to a decision. But I want to stop at actually saying, for example, years ago, my, my cousin wanted advice on whether or not he should pre-buy 40,000 gallons of diesel. Mm. And that's his job. And I'd already told him, I'm not going to tell you how to do your job. And when he had told me, should I buy the diesel? I said, that's a good question. And then he laughed. Like, in other words, okay. So we talked about where the markets are and what kind of, what percentage of our annual use did he want to like to have locked in. And by asking him some questions, he'd already thought through some of those answers. And then basically I said, now, what do you think given that? And then he was able to say, well, I feel pretty comfortable doing this. And then I can say, that sounds reasonable. So rather than telling somebody what you would do, where you don't make them go through the mental efforts of thinking it through, the alternative more is you're trying to give them affirmation that they're on the right track. And there's a big difference between giving affirmation as opposed to just telling them what you would do and then not making them think through how they should have come to that same decision. I agree. And also, That's a tough one. yeah, probably a little bit of the responsibility too, because if you say what to do and you're wrong or right, it's not their decision, right? What, well, you're taking your job, you're taking your job back. Yeah. Which is what you don't want to do. Right. And you know what, you got to make good decisions and bad decisions. And if it's all on your shoulders, it's, different than somebody else yeah. saying, do this. And you go, well, you told me to do that there. If you're that type of person, there's a, there's no accountability and that's not a way to train a leader. Right. Yeah. Okay. I love it. Mistakes, resolutions, lessons, regrets, fun stuff. Do you, I mean, for the sake of time, we've had a good session here. I could ask you and you could probably chat for five more hours with my prodding on some good stories. How would we like to wrap this up? Words of wisdom on the importance of having an intentional plan to help guide the exiting generation. Is that a good way to wrap up? Sure. Well, let us let me wrap up by saying we've got to take the fear out of retirement, out of the equation. Yes. And the fact is, is a lot of people are scared to death to retire because they don't see what it looks like beyond that. They have not th thought through a career path that has an extension in that career path to that board chair role. And by extending the career path thinking and putting the emphasis on it's a continuum. It's not a, you come to this point, you turn the reins over, and then you have to die because there's nothing left. Um, I would strongly recommend that people read David Brooks' book, Second Mountain, because he does a good job of having people think through milestones in their career where they define their success oftentimes as a major career in a business. But they're healthy, they're ambitious, but they're ready to transition out of that role. But if they can think of, well, there might be a second mountain or even a third mountain I could climb that would be equally as rewarding. Mm. And whether it's community service or working in your church or whether it's working in another career or woodworking, intentionally thinking through what that next mountain might be. If you put those two things together, um, I can't tell me how many times I've done this workshop where people have come up and said, huh, board chair, transition coach. That's a job I've been looking for all my life. I just didn't know it existed. Nice. So we give, we give people some language. We give some a concept that makes sense. Then it's up to them to go if, execute. You can't just go, that's a great idea, but not do anything about it. You've got to sit down with your family and say, I think this is a concept that makes sense. How do we work it through as a family? 
And it takes both incoming successors as well as outgoing managers working together to make this process work. Excellent. I think this right here, Dick, is what's the conversation that's missing in transition planning. And I fully believe, I mean, there's the financial end of it, but I fully believe this conversation right here, if we could help our founders with what's next, transition planning sure goes a heck of a lot easier. I do believe it. I've seen it. I've seen it. Well, it's a stumbling block. And until we get this concept in your head, they're just going to procrastinate in depth. Yeah. Amen. Oh, Dick, this was wonderful. I always enjoy our conversations. You are a fountain of wisdom. Thank you for spending the time. If people in our audience, I know you do coaching and I know you have some clients and you work them through this exact process in addition to farm business management. Can you do a final shout out about how people connect can connect with you and how you work with farmers? That's a great place to wrap up. Well, there's a lot of people that are out there that do what I do. And I've spent the last 20 years focusing more on consultant training. So there's actually um, consulting contacts that are registered on my website. There are materials like my guidebook that go into this tough topic in great detail. So if you're, you're saying, okay, this makes sense. I need to put a more professional governance structure in place. I need to start more clearly defining what a, what a agronomy manager versus a CEO means versus a board chair. Um, putting these disciplines into practice by putting documentation together is not done overnight, but it's a very doable thing. And as your business has evolved, to more and more size and complexity, spend the same time working on your business that you're doing working in your business to polish up these processes. And I think you'll find that um, this is not a huge challenge. It's just part of running a business and and having people successfully transition to various roles in business. I love it. Thank you again, Dick. I really appreciate our conversations every single time. Thank you, thank you. You guys. Thank you, Tracy. You're very welcome. Don't ever lose your passion. I try not to. You know, I'm passionate about helping farm families through some of these tough conversations. And your minds, the people I interview, are the ones that make it happen. So thank you. You in the audience, if you love this conversation, like it, share it. And hey, even if you're in the younger generation, maybe share it out, get it out there, play it so some of the founders see it because this is an important conversation and I'm sure you can agree. So thank you for tuning in and we'll see you on next week's episode. Bye guys. You've been listening to Impact Farming. For more great episodes and articles designed to help you manage and grow your farming operation, head on over to farmmarketer.com. Don't forget to sign up while you're there. We will see you on the next episode.